I work for a curiously named company that probably didn't plan to operate outside of Norway when they fixed their name. It was formed in the early 1950s, and it is now a foundation that has the purpose to contribute to spatial and societal development in Norway and abroad. It's a good place for its people, I think, and for its client too, uh, though it makes a poor investment, uh, living up to our objective of contributing to social and spatial development is rather costly. Norway is not without its problems. Many countries suffer from negative stereotypes. With Norway, it's the other way around. People think too well of Norway. The only negative thing that people know of Norway is that it's cold and far away. For this reason, they haven't been there and aren't planning on going there anytime soon. Probably this is the reason why we've been able to keep up our image for so long. We do have our problems, which by and large are the same problems as your problems, perhaps on a smaller scale. But what does make us stand out is that we have an official policy of decentralization. People should live everywhere, despite this having a cost. Even our neighbors in Sweden, just across the border, have provinces that suffer from low self-esteem and have given up on themselves. Norwegians, on the other hand, has plenty of self-esteem. Too much self-esteem, the Swedes would agree. The cities look down on the rural areas, but then again, the rural areas look down on the cities too. Nobody feels inferior. At the end of the last road, in the final village, there sits people who think of themselves as the next natural prime minister, and sometimes they are. My opinions are not only impacted by my ingrained Norwegianness. Many years ago, meaning to stay for four weeks, I went to Arabia to help introduce the street addressing system. I came back 10 years later. The Arabs were surprisingly similar to my own tribe in Western Norway, and I quickly found myself at home. Being comfortable around people with strong opinions and loud tempers was useful there too. I worked in Abu Dhabi and Muscat, two very different cities, but both with great ambition and enough money to back the ambitions up. But as we know, between ambition and money, there are many ingredients required for success. We planned national addressing systems. We worked on culturally aware urban regeneration. We worked on regional spatial strategies. And we planned transport corridors between Turkmenistan, Iran, and Oman, to name a few things. And so, incidentally, did Conference Maestro Schrenk. These days, I live in Belgium. Brussels has combined the three elements of congested traffic, dense bureaucracy, and passing water in public spaces into an art form. They like to eat, to drink, and to be without a politically elected government for years at a time. There is little not to love about the Belgians. They are wonderful, though from the perspective of a Norwegian, a mountain wouldn't be amiss. I do not work with planning in Brussels or Belgium. However, as an observer, I can say that Brussels is making slow but steady progress on most important fronts, as far as I can judge. So, why am I here? Well, first, to listen. Secondly, I work in a digital world. My work in planning has mainly been in supporting what I would call real planners. I've often been translating what planners would like to ask computers to the computers, and then translate the answers from the computers back to the planners. I've found urban planners to be at the same time incredibly stubborn in refusing to give up their large format plotters, their A0 sheets, and their markers, and at the same time to have an incredibly optimistic view of the potential of the Internet of Things, of artificial intelligence, and, well, everything that starts with the words smart or digital. I love urban planning. Norwegians do not love many things at all. We love nature, we love brown cheese, we love our cabins in the mountains, and occasionally our life partners, at least initially. Still, I love urban planning. 
Archaeologists wish to be Indiana Jones, or failing that, at least to excavate a pyramid. Psychologists want to be Sigmund Freud. Urban planners, however, are a force of good in a world led on by ever-shifting, always sinister sector interests. Urban planning is the art of making the best of it, weighing and balancing the big and little things that make life easier and more enjoyable, but that most people do not think of unless they're broken. To me, pursuing that balance is every bit as complicated as it is to run away from a giant ball, though perhaps slightly less entertaining to watch. But why this talk about ghosts? We are borrowing the narrative from Charles Dickens' Mr. Scrooge, a man who has been acting from a particular set of values his entire life. His KPIs are exclusively profit-oriented. He doesn't do much in terms of social impact studies. His human resources strategy leaves a lot to be desired, but he's unaware of it. He is, in short, a singularly poor planner. Given a glimpse into the future, Mr. Scrooge gets the chance to make amends for his wrongdoings and avoid some of their consequences. Planners like to see the future too. But it's always easy to predict something after it's happened. Looking forward is more difficult. Even mature sciences like meteorology, where we've been building, adjusting, and improving our models for more than 150 years, are still not able to say with certainty whether it will rain tomorrow. We can, however, say that it will rain next week. And in Norway, that will always be true. Looking backwards, however, we delight in saying any idiot could have predicted that. Borrowing the hindsight of Mr. Scrooge gives us the benefit of looking back at the present day putting ourselves in the shoes of this any idiot and using his prophetic abilities. Meet future will. Future will is an imagined city in a Norway-like country with some 250,000 citizens that exists only for the purpose of this presentation. Any similarity with real-world events and organization is purely coincidental as it would make it very difficult for me to be a consultant in Norway afterwards. It's a polycentric city with three heavily urbanized focal points surrounded by ever-expanding areas of low-rise and residential villas with industrial areas and large shopping centers on the fringes. People live everywhere, they work everywhere else, and in the evenings they go to recreation areas, play sports or visit cafes, restaurants or cultural venues all over. Since 2021, Futureville has invested heavily in Internet of Things and sensor networks, artificial intelligence, smart mobility, smart energy management, and by and large, anything smart that they've been able to lay their hands on. Futureville's growth stems from domestic migrants from surrounding areas and other cities. First, they lived in older, rundown buildings in the inner city, an old town. Then, as they gradually tired of parties, got a job, met a spouse, and started spawning offspring, they moved out to detached villas in the suburbs, usually on the opposite side of town from where they worked. To make room for the growth, Futureville first densified, then they built mid- and high-rises. But the well-to-do still kept moving to the suburbs, or if they stayed, in the city, they pushed up the prices at redevelopment sites to levels that forced existing residents out. The policy goals that drives Futureville are economic growth, environment and climate, social well-being. The performance of Futureville is, however, measured in terms of economy alone. Futureville believes the city should be profitable. A commercial agenda looks less offensive once it travels in the company of environment and social issues. All sort of tasks are outsourced to contractors. Futureville mostly does contract management. The contracts do not prevent budget overruns or delays, but are excellent at making responsibility and liability go somewhere else. Most projects are better rigged to handle failure than to secure success. Planning is going on as fast as possible to keep up with the actual development. Futureville is great on flood prediction two years after a flood devastated a city part. The city is excellent at monitoring soil stability three years after a derelict building was swept away by a landslide, and so on and so forth. Policies are reactive, design takes time, and implementation is delayed. By the time policies come into effect, they are sometimes obsolete. New unknowns have made them so. 
Futureville has invested in a digital twin for documenting all aspects of their urban infrastructure and city management. The twin makes it easier for non-experts to understand where things are located and interact. It's useful for a variety of purposes and has therefore become indispensable. However, it is also extremely demanding to keep up to date and a lot of resources are locked up in maintenance. But unless the maintenance is done, the digital twin rapidly devolves into a remote digital ancestor. The digital twin also has one important drawback over traditional visualization. It doesn't simplify. For many analytical and decision support purposes, therefore, expert users fall back on 2D maps for their simplicity and versatility. While it's impossible to describe the value of the digital twins in terms of money, it's very easy to describe the cost of it in terms of money. A lot. What puts the S in smart in Futureville is its extensive network of IoT sensors. Originally, Futureville had many distinct sensor solutions from many vendors. Some of these were locked into private clouds and data could not easily be integrated. Besides, it became a terrible number of contracts to manage. Therefore, all infrastructure is now sourced from a single multinational enterprise and leased along with cloud storage servers and more business intelligence dashboards than any human could possibly desire. Now, all data are locked in a private cloud, but because it's the same cloud, it's easier to integrate. Migration to a new platform is, however, unfathomably complicated and unthinkable. Nobody knows exactly how or where the data are stored, what happens to the data, who has access to them, what are the vendor's internal processes, etc. But it must be good, because they're multinational, right? The IoT investments have resulted in a lot of new essential operational costs. And also, all the processes that rely on the sensors are now reliant on the internet being up. IoT consumes a lot of money, time, and energy, and has its very own environmental footprint. Futureville has tried to limit use of private vehicles in the city by reduce, reducing availability of parking, uh, raising the tolls, lowering speed limits, and other measures of a similar type. However, the city made room for a large number of private actors to operate uh, mobility as a service, ride-hailing apps, and trip-sharing solutions. This, in sum, led to an increase in the use of private mobility, resulting in more exhaustion of the infrastructure and longer peak hours. Though the mobility investments were meant to meet su suppressed demand, they ended up inducing new demand. It became easier for people to make trips, so they made more of them. At its peak, 15 services operated by 17 companies were active in the market, causing future villagers to scratch their heads and install a lot of apps. To achieve its ambitious climate and environmental goals, Futureville has electrified everything that can be electrified. However, the consumption went through the roof. Futureville's grid is connected to the International Electrical Electricity Exchange, and while it in the fall and spring runs on green energy from hydropower, in cold winters and dry summers, it's a net importer of energy whose provenance is spoken less of. Policy doesn't favor further exploitation of hydropower in Norway, nor nuclear power. Wind was long seen as hopeful, but the population for some reason soured on wind uh, out of uh, noise and aesthetical reasons. As a consequence, they became political poison and wind was laid to the side. Future will therefore invest in rooftop solar power as well as electricity and heat generation from waste processing. Both were successful but their combined output did not go far in terms of meeting the increased demand. Futureville had great faith in artificial intelligence and bought a wide range of models to predict the impact of investments in the economy, in infrastructure, as well as predicting future demand. AI was useful for automating many manual inspection tasks, such as detecting the maintenance state of road surfaces, inspecting um, traffic flow or detecting leaks in water pipes, but Futureville was very surprised to find that AI didn't do anything beyond classification and detection. The technology had been sold to them with the pro great promises, the hopes for its contribution in doing stuff, 
were far greater than the stark reality of merely generating more data to support old-fashioned manual decision-making. That might be just as well. Few knew what the models did and how, and public enthusiasm for automa automated decision-making based on AI models never materialized. Like any self-respecting city, a future will like the occasional smart-looking but rather impractical and space-ineffective buildings as monuments of their greatness. More efforts were also put into designing with reuse in mind. Existing buildings, much like Lego, became blocks from which the next building could be built, facilitated by the digital twin. Future will also had great faith in smart buildings. All government buildings were equipped with smart control systems for water, heating, ventilation, and the whole works. Since the smart systems were bundled with construction contracts, different subcontractors supplied systems for each building, resulting in a very large number of different systems. The immediate cost savings anticipated by Futureville were offset by a number uh, of years due to a cost of acquisition. But what Futureville had failed to take into account was the very large reinvestments and operating costs required to keep the infrastructure running. Costs that in the end competed with the cost of maintenance of physical infrastructure. Least glorious, but decidedly most useful, all residents of Futureville, rich and poor, had a daily need for sewerage. Futureville had success with controlling its wastewater network by means of IoT and monitoring its performance by artificial intelligence. Furthermore, investing in circular economies, Futureville turned its wastewater processing into heating, electricity, reclaimed water, and sewage sludge that partly could be used as fertilizer. Manual overrides were necessary, though, in the event that the, of the internet being down. The anticipated savings in operational expenditure therefore did not materialize. It was still necessary to keep people on to operate the systems manually in case of breakages. Since the advent of the GDPR directive, the many application service providers who previously had not been aware of how to exploit big data mined from the use of their applications were suddenly forced to study the topic. What they found was that people will say yes to anything as long as a box disappears from their screen from the content that they want to look at. By exploiting this human weakness, the many vendors made future villers sign off on a level of surveillance that was unmatched even by the deepest, darkest, and wettest dreams of George Orwell himself. Privacy is a thing of the past, and at this time, the only privacy in future will lies in obscurity, getting lost in the vast quantities of information out there. Because people can now mine all the information they want legally and doesn't have to steal it anymore, hacking is less of an issue but smart city systems are networked and therefore vulnerable to attacks. An endless number of openings into the networks exist, and in the civil protection context, the risk increased manifold. Systems are running from server rooms that we no longer know where they are, how they're managed. There are the traditional leaks in offices, the blatant neglect of the, even the most basic security protocols that will exist in every one of the offices in which we work in. There is the blatant ignorance of invisible people who are able to enter into an organization and act as if they were there, belong there. And there is the more social mechanisms of gossip, eavesdropping, and disgruntled colleagues who may leave the organization. More and more people work from public locations. Public Wi-Fi's are hotspots for hacking, man-in-the-middle attacks. And with this COVID situation, the home office has become a perfect breeding ground for any sort of cybersecurity issue. The home computer is one hole, the smartphone is another and possibly worse. There is no effective divide between the private and the, and the professional space on the phone. Younger children in the household have no specific fear of viruses or malware and clicks on whatever brings their game back to the forefront. And finally, the vast amount of smart home appliances, each and all constitute a hole into the network that ultimately controls water, electricity, traffic, 
and a lot of city services, and no longer just your browsing history, which is the only aspect of cybersecurity which most people are a bit concerned about. So, in summary, technology can help us, does help us, and will continue to do so. All the technologies that I have highlighted weaknesses of now will mature. But where a computer model acts only by logic, people act by values, and those values often change, and they are sometimes irrational. The Internet of Things may contribute to efficiency, but it will always also contribute complexity. The Internet of Things comes with hidden costs and the risk of becoming hostage to vendors racking up extensive infrastructure costs that compete with the expenditure of keeping the city maintained itself is a genuine risk. Artificial intelligence is not good at making qualitative decisions, but excellent at making guesses at a very large scale. One size does not fit all in urban planning, and a concept that works one place cannot successfully be transferred to another unless all the factors match. Discretion, discretion for each individual case is preferable to standardized approaches. Every place has its own premise. Well-meaning innovations that seek to satisfy suppressed demand may exhaust the infrastructure due to inducing new demand. And finally, and possibly on a positive note, given the sector that most of us are involved in here, urban planners with local knowledge, awareness of people's values, and broad skill set will have a role that is more important than ever for many years to come. Many thanks for the attention, and I hereby hand back the floor to Maestro Schenk.